Hello. Ah, there we go. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for joining. It's really awesome to see so many people here. We'll be kicking off in 30 seconds or a minute or so, just as, as everyone's settling in. So thanks so much. Hello, good morning everyone. <laughs> it's uh, there's sunshine out there but it's cold out there so at the same time. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us in this uh, very important meeting and uh, it's really great that we have to see each other face to face. We are used to just meeting online and uh, uh, we are very happy that we are here in Montreal and uh, the conference of parties, the 15th conference of parties has been going on with different discussions and we are positive that things will be well at the end. And before I continue, I would think I would like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, recognize the, um, the indigenous people of this land, the Kanyayeke and the, uh, the Mohawk community who live around here and their elders who have been here with us since the beginning, coming from the indigenous, uh, and indigenous people and local communities. We've been having quite a number of meetings, but we have been uh, recognizing them in every meeting that we go because it's important. This uh, used to be their land, and it's a land that is, today is, uh, this place is called Morial, but originally that's where they are, so it's always good to respect and recognize that part of land. I would also like to, um, to I'm very happy today that I meet my co-chair. We've been working together for a long time, but we haven't met almost a year. And today I'm very glad that I'm meeting him face to face and also some of you. And we look forward for this particular meeting, which is quite loaded and very informative. And we, we have been having quite a lot of work done and very successfully. And I'll hand over to, Tim, uh, to Tom to be able to uh, continue with the introduction. Then we come back. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lucy. And yeah, as Lucy said, it's been a, a whirlwind experience since the launch of the UN Decade. And we feel like we know each other so well. But it's really exciting to actually be in person encountering the rest of this board. Because I think it's a time that we can really spark a lot of conversations that are really relevant in this space. Obviously, this year's COP is a very exciting one. We all know that we're excited about the potential for ambitious targets in the negotiations. But there's also just a buzzing world of ambition around biodiversity initiatives. And it's kind of overwhelming to know how many things we should be getting involved with, how many things we should be in integrating. But today, we're going to be focusing on a thing that, whether you like it or not, we are all engaged in. We are all a part of. And that's the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. This is an initiative that launched in the last couple of years to really try and spark inspiration for the, for the conservation and restoration of biodiversity across the planet. And today we're sort of kicking off this conversation on the UN Decade, partially to, to drum up some attention for, net, for tomorrow, which is going to be a really exciting day where we're going to have the announcements of all the flagships, flagship projects, where, which are really sort of key, uh, key players in this movement because they are not only showing us... Uh, powerful and important ways forward, but they're also giving that inspiration about highlighting the potential that conservation and restoration can really be a scalable and sustainable initiative. Um, but today, we're going to be focusing on the wider network, because the UN Decade isn't, isn't only those practical movements. It's also a vast network of, of, of people interacting across political spheres, public spheres. There's a huge amount of inspiration and public engagement and innovation across that space. And I think what we're hoping to do today is to highlight the players that are, that are contributing to some of that, that movement and to introduce some of those thoughts. And we're going to then f end it on a sort of inspirational film that Leonardo DiCaprio has produced for the, in support of the UN Decade. And hopefully we'll have a bit of in, uh, sort of uh, entertainment along the way. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. To, and also at the same time, uh, it's very uh, great to know that despite the fact that we have been having both at the regional international level quite some uh, uh, activities, 
on the decade. Uh, at the same time, at the local level, uh, different of you, different partners, different organizations, the youth, the women, indigenous people have also been very active down on the ground. So it's really something that everyone is concerned about uh, restoring our biodiversity, restoring about our natural resources that have already been um, impacted on. So it's really good to make sure that at least uh, uh, the ecosystem restoration, the advisory group has been having quite a number of activities, very successful ones. And uh, despite the fact that we are here today, we were also in Sharm El Sheikh and we visited communities in Abiba uh, in the South Sinai and we were able to see their work down there, and that's why I'm mentioning and recognizing the role played by uh, uh, different indigenous and local communities at the ground level. And it's also at the ground level, national, regional, and international. And it's also good to say that we've been really very successful in different ways. In the last year or so, we have Hindu uh, Ibrahim, who is also one of our indigenous community uh, uh, success leaders, was on the front of the New York Times for the inspiring work develop, developing networks of indigenous leaders to share their wealth of knowledge and insights. We've also had James Honeybone uh, produce a pioneering award-winning documentary that's going to be, uh, you know, Tom is going to give us more information on Netflix with the Batak Obama showing the unbelievable value of national protected areas across the world. And as you know, the 30 by 30 discussion has been on here for quite some time, and it's also been very uh, um, intensive and sometimes controversial uh, in people understanding different issues, especially for us indigenous people and local communities where we've been demanding that our rights must be re respected. And, on, uh, and one of our key partners, Restore, was selected by Prince uh, William is one of the selected finalists of the Earth Shot Award for their work bringing transparency and connectivity to hundreds of thousands of local initiatives around the world. So again, here you see the success of the many stories that we have, and we really want to share them and continue to share them so that we motivate the work of the Ecosystem Restoration Advisory Group and the flagship, as uh, he has already mentioned to you, Tom. Perfect. Thank you so much. So we're now going to be kicking off proceedings by introducing some of our speakers and I'm hoping they're going to capture some of the imagination. And I think we've got no better way to kick things off than uh, with Peter Wallab uh, Wallaben, who's been, who's a, he's a forester and an author of the best-selling book, The Hidden Life of Trees, that many of you will know. Uh, he, we're going to be kicking off with a, with a video presentation. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here in person, but he's sent uh, an inspirational video to get things going. I'm a forester, author and environmentalist. I think it is very important that the United Nations has declared the decade of ecosystem restoration. Every day we receive horror stories about the state of our planet. This could lead us to become depressed or fatalistic. Neither helps in the face of the climate crisis. And while Optimism may improve our mood. It does little to elevate the destruction of the environment. The order of the day is action. Action leads to confidence, a positive feeling, which is fed by the hope that the action will lead to success. There's every reason to hope. The decay projects show very well that it is worthwhile to take action now. In doing so, we must think globally and act locally. And that means rich countries must help poorer ones to let nature return. At the same time, and this is very important, the richer states must also do enough themselves. A simple example is protected areas. Here in particular, densely populated industrialized countries have some catching up to do, as I see here in Germany, for example. They often say that everything is cultivated land and there's no room for protected areas. But if we look at our meat consumption, and there, uh, there's, uh, are still possibilities. Almost 30% of the country's land is farmed for animal feed. If we reduce meat consumption, there would be more land left for protected areas where true wilderness could be re-established. It is the same with reforestation. 
Land in poorer nations is often brought up and reforested, not always with the consent of the local population. We need a joint global effort everywhere. Nature knows no national borders. And that is why it is so important that we act internationally and together. A nice example is this old beech forest that we were able to protect together with the inhabitants of this village. The forest consists of around 200 year old beech, oak and other deciduous trees. In the past it was used for timber extraction and the more valuable trunks were sold to the sawmill industry. Germany now has only a few per mill of such forest left. Through pri private donations, the forest could be put under protection and with the donations, the village can uh, compensate for the loss of income from timber sales. It is not only the trees that have gained, but also the people. The beautiful old forest cools the hot summer air and also provides more rain. Environmental protection does not protect nature from us humans, but helps us to protect ourselves. Environmental protection is also a sign of tolerance and empathy to important human qualities without we would have no future. In this sense, I'm very happy about the United Nations initiative and hope that together we will use this decade to bring about a green tipping point for our ecosystems a positive tipping point triggered by all of our actions and confidence. Thank you. So now we have the first of our in-person speakers and I don't think I need to do much introduction for this person. It's someone that many of you will know. We have John Liu coming here. He is an ecologist, filmmaker, and the foundator of the, the Restoration Camps Network, which is such an insp inspirational sort of initiative, bringing restoration and, and economic well-being to local people across the planet. Over to you, John. Well, hi. Thank you. Um, what's this? Oh, I, I'm just going to point at Lucas, if that's OK. Um, uh, so hello, uh, it's, it's good to be here, and um, I uh, am, have to overcome my basic shyness in order to, to speak to you, so instead I'm going to show a video. So I'm around if anybody wants to talk to me, and Lucas, take it away. After 15 years as an international television producer and cameraman, the World Bank asked me to document the restoration of the Lus Plateau in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River in northwest China. There it became clear that it is possible to restore large-scale degraded ecosystems. For the past three decades, I've been documenting, studying, communicating about, and stimulating the restoration of degraded ecosystems around the world. In 2009, I met the visionary ecologist Willem Farida, then the country director for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature in the Netherlands. Willem helped to produce a film I made called Hope in a Changing Climate that was broadcast on the BBC one day before the Copenhagen COP15. We also collaborated on two films with the Dutch public television network, VPRO, called Green Gold, Regreening the Desert, and Green Gold, Regreening the Planet. Willem eventually left the IUCN to define the four returns methodology of privately invested restoration and to create the Common Land Foundation. I've been the ecosystem ambassador for the Common Land Foundation since it was founded. The Common Land Foundation, together with local partners, now have over two million hectares in four core landscapes in the Netherlands, Spain, South Africa, and Australia. In 2016, I began to have recurring dreams about people going camping and restoring the earth. I wrote an essay called Earth Restoration Peace Camps that was published in Permaculture Magazine. 
After the essay was published, tens of thousands of people began to discuss it on the internet, declaring that this was what they wanted, and the Ecosystem Restoration Camps movement was born. When 1,000 people pledged to share 10 euros per month, or 120 euros per year, the first foundation was formed in the Netherlands. In 2017, the first camp was established in Spain, connected to land participating in the Common Land and Alvalal project there. In the second year, there were two camps. In the third year, there were 21 camps. In the fourth year, 37 camps. And by the end of 2020, there were 50 camps and communities. Currently, there are more than 55 camps and communities in six continents. There are urban camps, camps working on coastal restoration. The first camp in the United States was created in Paradise, California, in response to the disastrous fire that killed 85 people and destroyed the city of Paradise. There are camps in deserts, in grasslands, in all sorts of ecosystems. The concept of direct action by local communities is the low-hanging fruit and must be supported because it's the most efficient and the lowest cost with the greatest impact. The only way we can mitigate and adapt to climate change is to physically restore the Earth's natural systems. The only way to ensure the survival of biodiversity is to physically protect and propagate the most endangered species. We cannot do this with centralized control. We have to do this with consciousness so that the central intention of human civilization becomes to restore all degraded land on the earth. The people who are most available to do this are also the people who are the most vulnerable. We need to empower them and to employ them to restore fertile soils, to restore the hydrological function, reforest the once great forest systems, to transform monoculture industrial agricultural lands to massively diverse regenerative agriculture systems, and to ensure that those who have been wronged over long historical time can regain sovereignty over their own lives and enjoy equal rights. When we understand that we must address food insecurity and historical injustice together with protecting biodiversity, combating desertification and climate change, then we have reached the paradigm shift in human civilization that can ensure that human civilization can survive at this time. We have free will. We don't have to be a weapon of mass extinction. We can choose. By empowering the most vulnerable, we can stop worrying about feeding the hungry and see them as equals and even as heroes, leading humanity to a sustainable future. Thank you so much, John. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so now is where we go a little bit ad-libbing because we have the first person who I'm supposed to be introducing who I, have, I haven't bumped into yet. Is Dario here? Dario Major is uh, our next presenter. Okay, well, Dario is, if anybody sees Dario wandering around outside, uh, Dario is very excited to present. Um, he, he, so I think we'll, what we'll do right now is we're going to nip on to the next person who is Lu Zhe. And we are incredibly excited to, to, to introduce Lou as well. She is a conservation biologist and the deputy director of Peking University Center for Nature and Society. So over to you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I do need a slide. Oh. <laughs> Should I just put punch? OK. Nothing? Well. <coughs> Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. I'm so delighted to share one story of a uh, nom nomadic communica community um, took the action to restore their own grasslands. Well, 
it's on the Tibetan Plateau. And the Tibetan Plateau is mo among the most sensitive lands that's affected by climate change. One of the impacts of climate change is land degradation because of a melting of permafrost, for example. And um, so this is the landscape of uh, Tibetan Plateau. And you see that the temperature change on the plateau. And grassland degradation has multiple uh, uh, causes. Um, climate is one, and uh, overgrazing can be another one. And things put together, uh, 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 things may become worse. And policies that change the nomadic uh, 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 grazing pattern uh, may also contribute to this, because settlements of nomadic population is overall so, uh, 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 overall urge from all governments all over the world and uh, on the Tibetan Plateau, the similar things happening too. So, but impact, I think that has benefited uh, uh, social welfare somehow, but for the ecosystem, it may not be the best choice. So that needs to be further studied. But in any case, this grassland Degradation is new to nomadic population because it never happened before. Climate change is a new thing, and overgrazing, the policies, uh, uh, settlements are also new things. So in the traditional knowledge, they do not have the a measure to deal with it. Um, when we talk about how to build resilience to the grassland, they would say, you know, let, the, let the climate, let the weather decide, or let the gods decide. Um, yeah, that, that, that may work, but uh, it may take a long time. And the, the truth is that desertification in this area has been uh, great. So, Bazang was a graduate from Tibet University, and he returned home after graduation and discovered his hometown. Home village has been greatly de desertified, uh, so he decided to do something. And uh, this is a, used to be, this is a, a chart to show the, um, the intensity of desertification in his hometown, um, which the grassland is not only just about livelihood or grazing, it's a, it's the identity of nomadic population. Uh, so uh, there used to be wetlands and uh, grasslands, so he decided to, to do something. It's also habitats for endangered species such as black-necked crane. <clears throat> and one of the villages, the sands are burying uh, the, the house, so it is so significant. So. The, when dealing with this issue, he started to think about how to mobilize his village, fellow villagers. Um, just talk about growing grass or re restoring grassland doesn't seem to make people interested. So he learned from his mother, um, you know, the ancient history and the culture on how to describe the relationship between people and nature, people and land. He took that as an entry point to mobilize people to, you know, look at what happened, what's happening currently, and is that a harmony relationship, and the harmony is what traditionally people were looking for and maintained. And obviously, things now went beyond what the traditional knowledge could cover. So combined with scientific knowledge and the uh, traditional knowledge, which is especially good at you know, the, the philosophical level and the governance level, the how to organize people on the ground, but how to restore the grassland may need scientists to help. Um, new technology, and uh, these are nomadic people, they are not agriculture people, so planting thing is not their expertise. So teaching the, these nomads, herd, herd men, to uh, grow grass became the job. But what we found is that 
it's it's not so hard to grow things on the on the on the on the land. Um, what we found is that they actually became very innovative how to make this happen. Uh, not only to grow grass, which is relatively easy, if you have seeds and you plow it and you you grow. But what's more important is to maintain the grassland together with livestock. So management, adaptive management, is what the, they are good at. So, so the, the whole process included mobilization of community and grow grass and maintenance of grassland. And they created many uh, uh, tools to make it happen more easily. And like this, um, and they mobilized, he mobilized the different groups, older people, young people, kids, children, to all participate. And management after the use of the grassland uh, in the most sustainable way becomes a cri cri critical uh, uh, step, which is improvement of the past grass planting projects that's run by government that was typically inviting companies to grow grass government pays for it and companies plant and, and uh, uh, grow grass, then after uh, the, the plants, the grass grow, they left. And the maintenance was, was no one's responsibility. So this project he run, uh, he has been doing this for 10, year, 10 15 years, and uh, tens of thousands of square kilometers of uh, 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 land has been restored in his hometown. So. This is a, a positive, so these are some, uh, um, some impact of the, this project. You see clearly the same place and the grass restored. Um, and uh, researchers also provided evidences uh, to, research, to study this land and uh, they monitor what changes happen. You also combined traditional knowledge that to see how much Grass, how many grass species after how many years in one palm sized land or in one body sized land, which is very interesting. Um, so it shows, they provided evidence to show how things happen uh, ch and are changed, and also economic benefits that brought to local communities. And to him, it's a return, the journey of return to homeland, not only. The, the village, but also a beautiful grassland. That's all. Thank you so much. So as we, as we tick on, we're going to get increasingly practical for a little bit, more towards the applied side of things, but I'm going to hit you with one more spot of inspiration because the next, the next uh, presentation will be by someone called James Honeybourne, who many of you will know as the producer of the award-winning um, Blue Planet series with, Do with uh, David Attenborough. This is a series that not only inspired millions of people immediately after, after launching, but it's also one that drove a lot of action. And that was actually sort of seconded by his, uh, his recent Netflix series that came out this year, which was, many of you will have seen, our great national parks with, um, de uh, with Barack Obama as the presenter. And this is really something that moves between the inspiration and the application, because we're getting onto the concept of 30 by 30 and the need to preserve the beauty of nature for both the animals and, and wildlife and microbes and plants that live there, but also the people who depend on it. So we'll uh, head over to the next video now. When you think about it, it's a terrible word, biodiversity. It sounds so dry, so scientific, motionless, really. And yet what we're talking about at COP is the continuing existence of the infinite wonders of nature in all their glory and spectacle and colour. My name is James Honeybourne, I'm a wildlife filmmaker and I've been making wildlife films for over 30 years. I'm based in Bristol, England. And in that time, I have witnessed great changes to the health of the natural world. Just this year, we've had camera teams on expeditions across every continent and in every ocean. There's a building pattern to what we're all witnessing. There's increased chaos and extremes in the natural systems that are shaping our world and less predictability in where wildlife can now be found. Wild spaces are becoming 
increasingly scarce and precious. They're being lost at a terrifying rate. So extinction, pollution, habitat degradation, climate change, these major crises are all acting together to make our natural world sick. And the sicker the planet becomes, the more inevitably we will all suffer because we all need nature and we can't survive without it. Our own health and the health of future generations depends on the health of the planet and the planet's health depends on nature doing its job. And it can only do that if there are sufficient wild places on earth for nature to call home. It's an extraordinary thing when you come to think about it that over the millennia nature has given our planet such great powers of resilience and balance and yet at this critical moment in history it seems so fragile so easily destroyed at our hands i know from our many expeditions that where wild places are being restored to their natural state both on land and in the oceans truly incredible things can happen nature can bounce back we can heal what we have broken if we just put our minds to it we can help the world recover to be healthy once more we can rewild we can restore and we can reimagine our world for future generations of people and indeed future generations of all species nature can't wait any longer we need to act now thank you Okay, as we move more beyond the inspiration and towards the application, there's one key part of this process that I think doesn't get enough attention in, in our conversations, and that is the role of faith. And so it's with that I'm really excited to introduce Gopal P uh, uh, Patel, who's, gonna be, who's a faith-based environmental activist who's leading huge movements to connect that concept of faith with the environmental activism that we need across the planet. So over to you, Gopal. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tom. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Tom mentioned, I work with faith-based communities globally on environmental issues here at COP15. We have a delegation of over 30 religious organizations representing hundreds of millions of people of faith advocating for a strong global biodiversity framework. I'm a senior advisor to the Center for Earth Ethics in New York City and also on the advisory board for the UN Decade. And this year, when we were looking at the work of the decade and how to engage faith-based organizations, we asked ourselves a question, what is the role of faith, spirituality, and religion in the work of ecosystem restoration? And what we realized is that faith communities are some of the longest sustainable communities in the world. Some of our communities have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So how do we bring that wisdom of long-term thinking, of sustainability, of grassroots engagement to the work of ecosystem restoration? And so this year we conducted a series of dialogues globally, all online. We looked at issues in North America, Africa, the Middle East, um, India, and other parts of the world to see what faith communities are doing at a grassroots level to restore ecosystems, whether it's rivers or cities or sacred species or urban areas. Faith communities are engaged in the work of ecosystem restoration all over the world. And what came out of these dialogues were fantastic stories, fantastic ideas, and a number of really important principles that we felt could be integrated into the work of the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And so we are in the process now of distilling those 10 principles, and they'll be coming out later next year, and we hope to integrate those principles into the work of restoration work across the world. Another thing that came out of that work is that a lot of faith communities at a grassroots level are doing restoration work, but don't know that they're doing it. They oftentimes frame it as climate change work or disaster risk reduction or other kinds of environmental work. And so we've partnered with an organization called the United Religions Initiative, which is the largest grassroots faith-based organization in the world. They work with over a thousand interfaith communities globally. And tomorrow we'll be launching with them a guide for how communities at a grassroots can do multi-stakeholder, multi-faith dialogues around ecosystem restoration in their communities. Some of the principles that we found 
that's really important for faith communities that we hope to integrate into the broader work of ecosystem restoration are very simple and obvious things that I think sometimes we miss, such as celebration. The faiths are wonderful at celebrating success, celebrating key milestones, celebrating the joy of the natural world. And so we feel like that should be and could be amplified in the work of restoration work. We also identified that faiths talk a lot about inner restoration, that oftentimes the outer world is broken because we internally are broken and disconnected from ourselves. So how do we do inner restoration work so that we can do the outer restoration work? Another principle that came out of our work was relationship. That faith communities oftentimes and overwhelmingly look at the natural world through the lens of relationships. An indigenous leader once told us that what the West calls resources, we call relationships or relatives. So how do we foster a sense of relationship, interconnectedness between humanity and the natural world? So these are some of the ideas that have come out of our dialogues over this last year. Now we're in consultation and discussion with the Decade Secretariat, with the Unite, with, um, World Resources Institute, with the WWF Beliefs and Values Program, to see how can we bring these values from the worlds of faith and spirituality into restoration work at a grassroots level. We're very thankful to the UN Decade team, to Natalia, JP, AK, and also um, the advisory board co-chairs for this work. We are just getting started. But as I said, here today at COP15, faith leaders are representing hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And if we can mainstream ecosystem restoration in those communities as well, the impact could be phenomenal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was incredible. I, I really, I mean, who could argue with this essential role for a piece that's so, I think, underrepresented in this movement? Uh, the next person that I'm going to introduce is somebody who is actually playing a very important part in the discussions are, uh, and the negotiations around the role of Russia in, in the conservation of nature. Slava Fetisov is the, the chair of the Russian Society for, the nat for Nature Conservation and somebody that's playing a, a very important role in, in some of the commitments and pledges that have been made uh, in the conference today. So I'm going to hand it over. I think we've got a video presentation from Slava. The topic of biodiversity conversation is a constantly and the spotlight at the major international events. Many states note the progress made uh, to date in the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and the need to finalize and adopt the program during the ongoing session of the conference of the parties in the Canada at the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations uh, Framework Conversation, the Climate Change COP27, held in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, the issue of the biodiversity also became one of the most important topics of the agenda, along with the issue of climate change. The host country organized a special biodiversity day. During the COP27, as a part of our global financial forum ecumeny, we organized discussion session that includes topics of the policy of the restoration, conversation, and management of ecosystem in order to solve the climate and biodiversity loss problems. Within the uh, framework of this discussion session, representatives of the government, business, and the private sector scientific community and the civil society of the Russian Federation put forward a number of proposals for realizing the climate potential of the so-called uh, solution in the field of the sustainable environmental management, nature-based solution. Russia has enormous potential for biodiversity conservation. We are talking about a unique system of the protected areas which uh, can be continuously developed. Possessing vast areas that uh, are currently out of uh, active use for economic reasons, Russia can provide afforestation on an area of over 60 million hectares, which, if forest uh, cultivation projects are implemented, can not only contribute to the conservation of the biodiversity, but also annually absorb up to 100 million tons of carbon dioxide. The largest area on the territory of our country is occupied by forest ecosystems. 
they make a very significant contribution to the conservation of the biodiversity and maintaining climate stability. And they are also subject to significant anthropological impact leading to their degradation. To refer, it's uh, important to take priority measures to support and protect them. As a chairman of the All Russian Society for Nature Conservation, the oldest environmental NGO in the country, we are 98 years old. I have signed several agreements with the government of the Russian regions to launch and uh, launch and decade of ecosystem restoration in the country. And we monitor how uh, these regions develop restoration projects. I have also sent uh, an official proposal supported by the administration of the president to the head of our country to launch an all-Russian project of the 10 years of the ecosystem restoration of the Russian Federation. We also plan to give a special role to the allocation and development of uh, ecology as a separate uh, branch of the science in the, our country. This is due to the fact that in the last two years, the relevance of all environmental aspects of life has increased tremendously. The level of international dialogue on the topic has also grown, which is noted by the leadership of the, our country at all levels in all branches of the government. The social and public level of significance of uh, the environmental agenda is uh, exceptionally high. Our earth can only continue to sustain us if we protected its biodiversity and ecosystems. My dear friends, nature can exist without us, but we can't exist without nature. It is a real treasure for the human being, and we shouldn't allow this treasure to slip through our fingers. Thank you very much, your Slava Fetisov. Okay. And next up is a very exciting speaker. We have Ana Maria Hernandez is the chair of the IPBES, which is the most important science-based document underpinning so many of the commitments that are being made here today. So it's with great pleasure that I'd like to uh, introduce her to the stage. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, hello. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be with you, to my dear, with, with my dear fellows of the um, advisory board also. Thank you. Uh, I just want to give, sorry, I'm short, so it's better if I'm here. <laughs> that way you can look at me. Uh, some reflections regarding the, the United Nations um, Decade on uh, Ecosystem Restoration. Um, I don't know if all of you or some of you knows our strategy. Have you read it? Do you know that the United Nations decade has a strategy? Well, you are invited to read the strategy, go to the web page, and within that strategy, you are, you are going to find 10 main actions. Uh, that are going to inspire the whole activities uh, under the, the, the decade. But I'm going, I, I want to comment on three of those actions. Shift behaviors is one. The other is invest in research. And the other is listen and learn. Of course, there are many more. Maybe you're going to see that Others are more important for your task than, than these ones. But of course, I have to talk from the science. And uh, from science, we are learning now to um, act and to understand how to navigate in a transdisciplinary way. It is not easy. You know that in science, we are used to work in silos. But now we have to learn to speak uh, together. And we are, when I refer to science, I also refer not only to natural sciences, but social sciences, including economics, including policy science, including sociology, anthropology, all uh, the sciences. And 
uh, of course, includes the other knowledge systems, such as citizen science, such as indigenous peoples and local communities knowledge and methodologies, because they, are, they have also methodologies. We don't have to forget that. But often, uh, I still can see it's a personal perception uh, that critical knowledge coming precisely from local communities and uh, indigenous peoples maybe sometimes is avoided or not incorporated into the programs and projects. Maybe sometimes uh, the researchers think that only their knowledge is the one and the local knowledge is not um, that does not reserve the space, deserve the space or attention. But the reality is that nobody can teach us better of what happens in the territories than the people who live from and with in the territories. Now, uh, that's why it's important all the cases the fantastic cases presented by our um, uh, dear colleagues from the advisory board and the 10 flagships that uh, we are going to launch. Uh, when the, tomorrow, yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> tomorrow, because there are inspiring uh, examples on how we are going together to address the commitments under the United Nations uh, decade. Now, the challenges are huge, but no, not impossible, I think. We have very insp uh, ins inspirational histories. We are listening to that um, at local level, at subnational level. But also, uh, I don't know if you have felt that there is this new sense of urgency to include restoration in the national and international policies and programs and action plans. One thing that we are seeing here in this um, COP15 is that we are talking about restoration, not only in this side event, but outside we are including restoration in the GBF, we are talking about restoration in the city summit, we're talking about restoration in the science forum, so it's everywhere. Uh, as uh, advisory board member myself, it has been fantastic to witness all the hard work of the team, of the core team of, of the decade, but also all the partners that are working together with that. And uh, also I had the opportunity to join the scientific committee. I don't know if you know that the United Nations decade uh, also have committees to support all the work of, uh, of, the, of the agenda that we have to fulfill. So we have, for example, a finance uh, committee, a uh, uh, scientific committee, and et cetera. Maybe, <laughs> of course, Tom uh, can, can, can uh, give you, uh, and Lucy, more, uh, more advice on this. So the, uh, the, the main lesson here that I have is that we uh, need to join people, knowledge, and resources. But also, of course, we have to adjust actions for ecosystems, for specific ecosystems. Uh, not uh, one size does not fit all, maybe, is the, say, the way that you say. Um, and, of course, in every territory, with every specific um, ecosystem, you have a specific uh, cultures, a specific dynamics within the territory, within with uh, the societies. So we have to learn about the positive um, uh, examples, but also uh, we have to learn from the gaps and from the difficulties that we are facing in the territory. And finally, I'm here to see that there's a lot of people taking care of restoration, and after this exercise, you're going to dive into the web page and you're going to become fans of the United Nations Decade on Re Ecosystem Restoration, and you're going to be also our supporting partners. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Anna Maria. And that is actually a really good uh, in introduction to the sort of structure of the UN decade. And it's important that you all know that there are task forces within the UN decade structured from everything between finance to conservation to, to, uh, to science. To, you know, there's, there's a variety of task forces which really are open to collaboration from all with, to integrate the expertise of all of you guys in the audience here and your wider networks. It's really key that we want more and more and more people engaged in those task forces so that we can drive it forward. But for now, the next person I'm going to introduce is Luke uh, Nakedja, who's actually the, the Executive Secretary General for the UNCCD to end deforest, uh, desertification. And so he's going to be presenting, I think, a video presentation now. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I am Luke Nakedja, and I bring you greetings from my sunny hometown, Cotonou, in Benin. When 15 years ago, in 2007, I took the helm of the Secretariat of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, processes of land degradation were like the fate of land use in agriculture, and there was then almost no specific pledge to restore. Nowadays, we are sitting on a pile of pledges to globally restore over a billion hectares of degraded land by 2030 as part of the SDGs. This is equivalent to the total land area of Canada. Effective and vigorous implementation is now required and the decade offers a unique opportunity to converge effort across all biomes. We must continue to push relentlessly towards higher ambition and effective action to make peace with nature through nature-based solution to the conundrum of crisis humanity's greed has generated. One of the goals of the decade is to make ecosystem restoration a movement, a groundswell one-fifth of the decade has passed, and I do not yet see the first waves announcing this groundswell. As we know, it will develop from the local and community levels, because in most ecosystem restoration success stories, local community leaders and innovative landscape and seascapes users have taken the lead in restoration effort. It is from local leadership and practice that it becomes a movement. Therefore, dear friends and colleagues, for global flagship performance to abound, we must highlight national and local successes in ecosystem restoration. In this regard, I bring you the how questions I'm grappling with. As member of the Decades Advisory Board, how can we contribute to sparkling such a movement of ecosystem restoration from the ground up. Building on the, the decade ideals, inclusiveness, joint coordination action and partnership, how can we ignite the creation of opportunities for multiple agents of change to work together, particularly at subnational levels? How could we acknowledge restoration leadership and innovation at these levels? What triggers can we provide? How can we mobilize science and knowledge and communication to sustain it? How shall we take stock of the new knowledge generated? In other words, how could we get all countries to have ecosystem restoration flagship initiatives that will also identify and analyze existing ecosystem restoration successes and failures, build and or support the grassroots movement for restoration and address policy and legal issues to enable conditions for scaling up and holding out as well as capitalizing on lessons learned and need for catalytic research and development activities to restore ecosystem at scale. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, let us take up the challenge of these issues for action. 
I look forward to working with you, building on the hope for impetus from this Biodiversity COP15. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, and our penultimate speaker for today is someone who, again, many of you will know. It's a very exciting person to introduce because Tim Christofferson is the Vice President of Climate Action at Salesforce, but he's also the first coordinator of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, one of the key people putting this entire thing together. So I am delighted to hand over to the main man. Thank you, Tom. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask all of you for a round of applause for this fantastic advisory board and for the UN team that runs the decade. Isn't that phenomenal? As Tom said, I'm here with uh, two hats. One is I'm uh, vice president for climate action. I lead the nature team at a company called Salesforce, a global technology company. We're a large investor in nature-based solution credits. We have a $100 million grant fund on ecosystem restoration. Um, but most importantly, I think we have 150,000 corporate customers in the world that all have a trust relationship with us. So we also try to convince every company in the world to do more for nature. That's part of my job. I have a third hat uh, that I also have to reveal here. I'm a small uh, landholder and on our family farm in Denmark. My family and I, we restore about 35 hectares of degraded agricultural land. So this is my hobby, my passion, and my job. So life doesn't get much better than that, actually. So um, it's, it's great to be here. And also, Salesforce does sit on the advisory board for the UN Decade. I wanted to um, also acknowledge one person who's not in this room, a young woman from Eritrea called Salina Abraham. She invented the hashtag Generation Restoration. So if you, if you post about this event, about anything of the decade, post generation restoration and you would be surprised every day on all social media channels there's a flood of stuff under that hashtag and it's increasing and increasing all the time and we're only in year two of this decade so when we designed the UN decade and now this is run by my colleague uh, Natalia Alekseva who is the coordinator of the UN decade I had the privilege to have that uh, have that job for a few years when we established the decade and we used new power principles, meaning sharing the decision making for the decade with all of you so that we empower as many people, organizations, communities as possible to take restoration action. Now, personally, when I started working on this, I had three test cases in mind that I wanted to observe to see if this was working because there have been many UN days and years and UN decades what difference are we really making? And I have uh, four pictures I want to show you that illustrate what these case studies are. This is in South Africa. It's the Eastern Cape. It's an ecosystem called the Tropical Thicket, and there's a wonderful indigenous plant there called the Speckbaum. And if you look to the right side of this, it's an experimental restoration plot, the right side of the picture. Everything in the background is what the landscape looks like now. And most people driving through this or looking at it would think, well, this is just what it looks like. This is an African savanna. But no, this in the foreground is what this used to look like and what it should look like and what it could look like again. But because the degradation happened over the course of 200 years, people have forgotten. So the inspiration that people like John Liu and others provide to show that large-scale ecosystem restoration is feasible is super important because nobody would know that all that land, and this is 1.3 million hectares. It's, a, it's an area more than 100 kilometers one way, 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers. It's, it's a huge area. And this is one of my first, is, is my test case. And how is this doing now? So there's a company that just signed the first 10 million dollar investment to scale up the replanting of this entire area with Speckbaum for carbon credits. This also happens to the, the best big five habitat in the world, elephants, rhinos, leopards, lions, and buffalo. So uh, it's hugely important for the water security of the Eastern Cape. This is my first um, test case that I had to see if things are working. 
and this is working. You go to the next slide. It's now being scaled up across that entire million hectare area. It's, it's a huge undertaking. It will cost several billion dollars. But then again, what is a few billion dollars for a critical infrastructure project like that, that will save biodiversity, save water for Port Elizabeth and other South African cities and help stabilize our climate? The second test case that I was observing, and we're only in year two of the decade, right? And this is already working. If you go to the next slide, is uh, the high Andean forests across South America. This is a picture from Peru. So in the Andes, there are cloud forests above 4,000 meters that have almost disappeared. Only 10% of them are left, polylepis forests, that capture a lot of water and then make it available through feeding wetlands to a lot of Latin American cities. Because the forest has disappeared, there's a water, there are water shortages. And only three years ago, there was a movement that start, was started by a, an NGO called Global Forest Generation called Acción Andina. The leader of that movement has just been appointed last month as a UNEP champion of the earth. His name is Tino Auca, an indigenous leader from Peru. And over only three years, they have mobilized 18,000 families, over 100 communities, in 400 sites to replant last year 3 million trees, next year 6 million trees. This is a social movement. And all these people work for free because they restore not only their ecosystem, they restore their culture, their purpose, their sense of community. So this is an unstoppable movement. And again, we're only in year two. So if you go to the next slide, and Tom didn't know this was coming, I also want to, of course, give a shout out to technology. So what enables us to make this decade one that really counts? It is partly technology. This is an outfit that Tom runs. He's too modest to mention it. It's called Restore. It's a global platform that brings together all the restoration projects um, in the world. And we have the power of technology in our hands to ensure that we can bring all of you together in generation restoration under that one global rallying cry. So we are all generation restoration. And to leave you with, with one thought, we often, un, we often overestimate what we can do in one year. Who hasn't been there to say, well, I'm going, this year I'm going to do all of this and this and this, and then at the end of the year you maybe achieve half of it. But we also often underestimate what we can do in a decade. In the next eight years, we'll be able to transform economies to build a multi-billion dollar nature conservation and restoration economy. We will be able to stabilize the climate, to come out of the free fall of biodiversity if we all work together. So we are generation restoration. This is our time. Thank you very much. Incredible, Tim. Thank you so much. As that is the message, restoration of biodiversity is possible at scale. I know there's challenges in the negotiations and there's huge hurdles to overcome, but it is categorically possible. And I think what Tim just introduced there shows the mechanisms for how it might be a possibility. Now, when it comes down to it, ultimately, the second example Tim gave there is a beautiful one because it talks about the concept of feedback loops. When, when communities and people and cultures get economically empowered by healthy biodiversity, you cannot stop it from propagating. And it's for those mechanisms that a lot of the scientists across the UN Decade team and, and, and the, 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 the broader network have actually been collaborating for a very long time to try to pull together digital insights and, and scientific insights that can help us to understand the distribution of biodiversity across the planet. And this is a vast network of ecologists working for the last 10 or 20 years, uh, building on the, on the big data revolution that's empowering this movement. And to, to introduce some of the, the, the efforts to pull all of that together to facilitate this economic empowerment of communities across the planet, I'd l I'm very, ex very excited to introduce Alexa Firmenich. And are you coming up, Simon Zadek? Simon Zadek will be joining in a moment to uh, launch a new in initiative. Should I get the clicker now? Yeah. How do I go to the next one? That one? All right, cool. 
Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to meet you all. I'm Alexa Fermanish. I work inside of the Crowder Lab. I'm a co-director of an initiative that I'm going to present today. Tom is very modest, but this is really, really exciting work that's coming out of the lab. And just hearing the other speakers and panels, there's been, I think that it's incredible that we're speaking about the awe of nature, the beauty of nature, the wonder of biodiversity, because this is why we're all doing this in the first place, right? We care about nature. We are nature. We're in love with our planet. On the other side, as some of the speakers have also said, there is this issue of data and measurement and science. And sometimes that stuff can be really dry, but it's also incredibly necessary. And so I like to think that the way that we're positioning seeds is to kind of bring those worlds together and to speak about the wonder and complexity of biodiversity, but also the hard tools that we need to measure, quantify, and finance nature at scale. So what we're developing inside of the lab in service of the UN Decade of Restoration is the world's first assessment standardized of biodiversity that tries to integrate the complexity of ecosystems and not just their individual parts. And this is really, really important because as you can see from this very kind of uh, inspiring and beautiful image of nature, historically what we've done, as a lot of people here know and understand, is we've isolated individual parts of the entire system because they've interested us we propagated them at scale into a sort of Western industrial monocultural system, in this case, food systems, right, food crops. We've blanketed the country and uh, the, the, the planet in monocultures. And now in terms of climate quick fixes, we've focused on carbon, thinking carbon excellent, okay, we can quantify it, it's measurable, it's individual units, although technically it's always also part of biodiversity. And what do we do with carbon? We say, fantastic, let's capture carbon, plant millions of trees, and what happens? Monocultures. And again, this is an example of what happens when we think nature is just species or water or ecosystem services. And what we're aiming to do with seed is to capture the interconnections between all of the parts of the system that is nature. And so by doing this, by bridging genetic species and ecosystem levels, looking at above ground biodiversity, but also below ground biodiversity, which practically doesn't happen now, and technical things like functional convergence, we're able to actually map the web, which means that for the first time ever, we get to illuminate these invisible parts of the map of nature that haven't yet been seen. And so we can see where biodiversity might be incredibly high in areas that other indicators and metrics don't quite capture. And our purpose here is to have this conversation be one of valuing the complexity and all the individual parts. Um, the way that we technically do that, we can get into more specifics, you know, you can find us afterwards. But essentially what we do is we take hundreds of global data sets and maps and layers of biodiversity and we bring them together. So things like connectivity, species, functional traits, and we combine them with dynamic remote sensing layers from satellites for any pixel on the planet in order to, let me just do this to create um, a sort of understanding, let's say, of how all the different parts of biodiversity come together to create the emergent phenomenon that is life, that is the fundamental thing that sustains us. And then with seed, we're able to attribute that from zero to one scale, so it's an index, for any pixel on the planet with zero being tarmac, car park, practically you know, devoid of biodiversity, and one being the closest natural reference ecosystem that's in some optimal state of, um, of biocomplexity, as we're calling it. And then, as I mentioned, we can combine that with satellite remote sensing layers to say, okay, how over time is this management approach restoring biocomplexity, degrading biocomplexity, with the intention that we can start to financially reward and also politically incentivize the regeneration of nature and not its destruction. So we mentioned restore, thank you, and CR Clara is over there. Um, and what we can start to do with networks like Restore, which have hundreds of thousands of sites from the restoration economy on their platform, is draw the pixel, quantify the biocomplexity, and begin to understand exactly how, over large um, spatial scales, these patterns of regeneration are actually taking form. Um, so this is an example that's on Restore of Death's Coffee Jungle. In a nutshell, that's what we're up to. There's obviously a bunch more technicalities and market use approaches. Um, you can imagine asset managers that want to know their portfolio, pension funds, countries, sovereign debt. I mean, there's 
any place where nature is being measured, we want the understanding to be, let's measure the complexity of the system and not keep isolating for these variables that lead to suboptimal ecological outcomes. Um, the last thing I will mention is that in order to scale the scientific uh, sort of approach that we're doing here, we need to be really careful about governance and ethics and market norms and rules. And everyone, you know, the conversation here on credits was filled yesterday because concerning there are a lot of concerns that are incredibly valid. And so we're partnering, and I'm going to hand over to a colleague of ours, uh, with Nature Finance. That's a Swiss nonprofit that is advising us on the market, and we're partnering with them to do the market uh, adoption and integration of, oh, there's like an echo here, adoption of the index into the market. So Simon, I'll hand over to you on that piece, and thank you. Brilliant. Well, I'll, I'll keep it really slow and quick. Um, I'm Simon Zadek, uh, and I work for Nature Finance, uh, which is a Swiss-based NGO, and we spend 24 hours a day focusing on how we can get global financial markets to take nature smartly, correctly into account. This is not a simple task, and it is not purely a technical task. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that. You know, the politics, the business interests, the competitive interests in many different ways doesn't always lead to the best possible way of understanding an ecosystem being taken into account by our banks, our own pension funds, uh, and other parts of global finance. Uh, so we're incredibly pleased and honored to be partnering with the Crowther Lab, with Alexa and Tom and the team who've developed this amazing piece of work um, to try and help them figure out how to bring it into the market and make it the norm for the way in which global finance takes nature into account. So thank you very much indeed. Perfect. Thanks so much, guys. That was amazing. And I must spread, must again mention that this is not just a Swiss thing. It's not. It, it, this is really co combining the academic insights over the last few decades to really pull together this vast network of insights that can hopefully empower markets that will help the redistribution of the Earth's finances towards local communities who are the ones responsible for building those feedback loops to, re to be empowered by nature. And with that, on that note, we're going to now have a little change of, uh, change of momentum. We're going to move over to a movie. And this is a movie produced sort of in support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It's about, about the, the devastating impact of wildfires in a region of, Port of, of Portugal and how it's impacted human communities and how that has also driven the need to, to build back nature into a, towards a sustainable future for those communities. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that movie now. Um, it is, I'll, I'll sort of give you a bit of pre-warning. It's incredibly emotional. You will be tear, tearing up at the end of it. This was uh, sort of Leonardo DiCaprio and his team produced this, um, helped to produce this thing along with a, an organization called Grain Media. And they've really produced this, this incredibly inspir inspirational thing that will touch your emotions, but also hopefully, hopefully lend us or uh, leave us with, a, with an idea of possible inspiration and hope for the potential of restoration around the world. So I'll uh, move on to the next bit now. And after that, we'll have a few of our